Again, we're glad to be back uh, in the study of our topic, which has to do with fellowship. It's been a little while since we've been able to get back on the topic, so I would, I guess, review some to bring our minds hopefully up to where we are tonight. I'm introducing this subject of fellowship by looking at the first chapter of John, first chapter of the epistle of John. While you may be turning there, I think it's good to remember that most of the New Testament is written to members of the Lord's church, the Christians, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, members of the body of Christ. We probably don't emphasize enough the importance of preaching the gospel, which is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1 and verse 16. To every creature, as Jesus commissioned the church to do in Mark 16, 15. But it's interesting to me that the last will and testament of Christ, our New Testament, 27 books making up the latter half of the Bible, that it is emphasizing more material for the member of the church than this for those outside the church. That has to say something. And I think it says at least this, that once a person is reconciled to God, justified in God's sight, sins are forgiven, the Lord's added that person to his blood-bought church, now you've got to keep them there. And that's exactly what you've got in most of the New Testament, trying to keep them faithful, trying to keep them steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. They need to know that their labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So while we are concerned about those outside of Christ, those lost in their alien sins, of course we are. We were all there at one time. But then when we become a Christian, babes in Christ, new at it, then we have to grow. There is no growth except that one can feed on the proper food. And that's the word of God. So in saying that, when we speak of fellowship, then we're speaking of being together and each one sharing with another. Before there can be fellowship between men, men must be brought back into fellowship with God. So a study of fellowship, first of all, is vertical. How am I brought into fellowship with God? Romans 3.23 says, plainly, Paul wrote to Romans, they were already Christians. They had known this. They had come out of it, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6, verse 23 says, plainly, that the wages of sin is death. And death means separation. It doesn't mean annihilation or going unconscious or ceasing to exist. It means you're simply separated from God and you're in a lost condition. When we speak of someone of being lost, we mean their sins are separated between them and their God. The only thing that can separate a person from God is sin, period. Nothing else. You may be all sorts of whatever you are in training in this world. That won't necessarily cause you to be saved. Because we're saved from sin. We're saved from sin by the gospel, the gospel of Christ. The good news is what gospel means. Good news because there's no other way for man to be saved. So when John is writing this, he is very concerned that the brethren remain in fellowship with God. And you can notice how he starts the whole epistle, which we'll go back over again. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled all the word of life. He's giving apostolic testimony. What we would say is eyewitness testimony to the Christ. Apostles could do that. Apostle means one chosen and sent out on a certain mission. Jesus chose the 12 apostles to be his ambassadors from the court of heaven to earth. 
Therefore, through them, he originally revealed the New Testament of Christ. And the early church knew that because they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2, 42. And we do too. Again, you notice to be faithful, you continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So you have John, an apostle, and every apostle could say what John did in uh, the verse we just read, verse 1 of 1 John 1. And he explains further the parenthetical expression that this life was manifested unto them, and they've seen it. In other words, it was an empirical matter. They could actually touch Jesus. They could remember the sound of his voice, all that went along with dealing with anything in the material world. But we really started with verse 3 as to the import and the directness of John in talking about fellowship. I'll mention this more later, but fellowship comes from a Greek word that is pronounced koinonia. It's not koine Greek. That's the common Greek in which the New Testament was written originally. But it's the Greek word from which we get fellowship, koinonia. And it means basically sharing, working together. One reason we call it fellowship in English, that comes from like a ship of fellows. When you think of the old sailing ships and all of the crew that was there and all the particulars that had to be done, uh, then they were a ship of fellows from the captain on down throughout the whole crew. They all had their part to do. There was proper authority and delegated authority and so forth. So they were a ship of fellows. Well, we are a ship of fellows on the ark that's headed for heaven. And we all have our part to play. It's not just a matter of saying, I am a Christian, which means of Christ. There's something to do. James spends a lot of time, as does really the whole of the New Testament, emphasizing what he just simply says when he writes, faith without works is dead. Now, he didn't write that to people outside of Christ. It doesn't mean it doesn't apply to them in teaching just when and how faith saves us. But he wrote that to those who had already been saved from their sins and the Lord had added to the church. They needed to know that faith without works is dead. Therefore, one who is a member of the church can be just where a lot of people are today and say, well, I know Christ is Son of God. He's the Savior. I believe in him. But they never get around to obeying him because they think if they do anything that they're trying to earn their salvation or merit salvation. Well, if that's so, before you become a Christian, what's James doing telling them after they become a Christian that faith without works is dead? It doesn't make sense. And so it is that James is saying, you members of the church, you Christians, you people who've heard the gospel, faith without works is dead. So it doesn't do any good to profess all these wonderful things about Christ and all these marvelous things about the church, no matter how true they are if we're not going to do our part. So he's talking about John is here fellowship. And you'll notice that he, he talks about that which we've seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, the us or the other apostles. And truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. Well, I said, I think one of the last times we were on this is that, I can fellowship anybody that John can fellowship. I know that because he's writing to my brethren nearly 2,000 years ago and thus writing to us because it's part of the last will and testament of Christ. And he's directing us to understand who is in fellowship with God as the apostles are in fellowship or were in fellowship with God when they walked this earth. He's saying you can have the same thing. Why would he say this to members of the church? Don't they automatically know that they must be faithfully adhering to the teachings of the New Testament concerning how to live the Christian life in the church? Well, obviously, he's concerned about a false doctrine leading him astray. And this tells me immediately that nobody's going to be faithful in the church as the New Testament defines faithfulness in the church. And not be concerned about doctrine. The word doctrine comes just simply from 
the word teaching, you're saying the same thing. When you say the doctrine of Christ, you're saying the teaching of Christ. So when people want to be in their own estimate, in their own eyes, great faithful servants of God, but they don't ever get around to doing what God says his children ought to do, then uh, they need to realize they're not as the apostles who were in fellowship with God. And according to John, he wanted all the members of the church to remain in fellowship with God. This also points out that if he's writing these two Christians, that it must be they can lose that fellowship with God. And they need to know that. Now, he goes into a particular problem. We won't go back through it that was going on in the church at that time. But while we don't have that problem that they had then, is the case with the number of things in the various letters to the churches and individuals. The truth that he taught applies to us today. I was thinking a moment ago when Steve was giving us our lesson to what's found in the as John closes out this first epistle. And we need to know this about the world in which we live. Now, it, John plainly says in 1 John 5, verse 19, two things. We can make a whole sermon out of this. 1 John 5, verse 19. <clears throat> and we know, no ifs, ands, buts about it. We know something. We know that we are of God. Okay. If he knows they are of God, he's writing this letter to those who are of God so that they remain of God. Remember the word Christian means of Christ. Then it must be that we can reach a stage of living where we're not faithful to God and we've lost our fellowship with God and lost our fellowship with others who are still in fellowship with God. Now notice the point I really want to make is the latter part of the verse. I'll read it again. And we know that we are of God. Then he says, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. I think the American Standard has it. I don't have it right here before me. The whole world lieth under the power of the wicked one. Well, I thought Jesus had all power in heaven and on earth, all authority. How can an inspired apostle of Christ writing part of the New Testament of the Christ says that the whole world lies in wickedness? Because the devil has great power permitted him. How do I know that? And one several ways to tell from the scriptures, one of the greatest ones is the temptation of Jesus. I'll give you all these kingdoms, the devil said to Jesus, if you'll bow down and worship me. Do you think that the devil doesn't have power to do such things? I think sometimes when we read that uh, our adversary, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion seeking who he may destroy, it's more like a little kitty cat that's rubbing against our legs with like a little milk to drink. But we ought to, since we like YouTube, we ought to go to YouTube and watch some of those lions, the way they deal with things. And they're anything but kitty cats. Well, inspiration says the devil's like that concerning you and me and everybody else. And he has power over this world. He's the wicked one. It's the devil that tempts us to sin. And once you've escaped his clutches in belief and obedience from the heart to the gospel of Christ, now you need the rest of the New Testament on how to stay free from him, how to stay in fellowship with God. When we were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, we did that as believers in Christ who had repented of our sins, resolved to turn from a life of sin, live the rest of our lives as much as we possibly could in obedience to the truths of God concerning living the Christian life. Being like Christ is what it amounts to since we're all members of his spiritual body. And that body is the church, Colossians 1.18, Ephesians 1. 22 and 23. And we need to stay there. Have you ever noticed with little children, uh, you got play pens. So you can put them in the play pen and since they haven't matured enough physically, they can't get out. Well, they're not supposed to be able to get out. Sometimes people find they matured more than they thought they did and they climbed out when they weren't looking. 
Then you've got these things they used to have. I don't know whether they still have them or not, where they'd put it between the rooms, you'd, like a little fence in the, where the door doorways there. So you keep them in one room. Well, that may be rather simplistic, but the New Testament keeps us in the proper room. Now, it doesn't do it without our will to want to stay there. There's where the analogy breaks down. We stay in Christ and active in Christ and therefore in fellowship with God because we want to. And if our want to wanes, then we may find ourselves drifting away. So John is plainly saying, uh, what's this world like you're in? Well, that was almost 2,000 years ago when John said the whole world lies in wickedness. Let me ask you, 100 years after John wrote this, was it still true? 500 years after John wrote this, was it still true that the whole world lies in wickedness? A thousand years, is that statement still true? Yes. 1,500 years, yes. Today, is it still true? Yes. And if the world goes on 2,000 more years in the future, every day between now and the end of the world, that's true. The whole world, life, and wickedness. Now, that's written to the Christian. Don't you think they knew that before they obeyed the gospel? Don't you think they wanted to be free from their sins and reconciled to God? If they did, why obey the gospel? Writing to people who had obeyed the gospel, who were Christians, to motivate them to greater service. Then Paul said in John, or rather Romans 6, 17 and 18, that you were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made servants of righteousness. Well, John's coming along and saying, you got to stay servants of righteousness. If you're going to remain in fellowship with God, fellowship with us, and fellowship with all others in the church, we're in fellowship with God. When you think of a sailing ship and all the people that are on that ship, as it used to be and still is as far as those who sail our ships, and that's a terminology that doesn't necessarily mean they're uh, sails. It's just terminology that's stuck over a ship going out onto the ocean to just drive all hands in their various positions doing their work. Well, it meant that if one did not do his work, he was he was derelict. He wasn't doing his part. That's the reason most of the New Testament is written to you and me as Christians. Saying you've got to do your part. And I'm going to tell you what your part is. And that's what we get into as we read all these things the New Testament says to members of the church. So we come down to verse 3. And we see him saying, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father, with his Son, Jesus Christ. Well, that's a marvelous statement. Well, just read that alone. It stands alone, by the way. Always note the context of anything, remote context and immediate context, but that statement stands alone for members of the church, for the Christians. And so we see that our greatest desire once we become a Christian is to remain in fellowship with God. And these things just don't lightly happen. So I might say this, the other side of fellowship's unity. You can't talk about fellowship, not think about the unity of believers, of the members of the church. And you can't talk about New Testament unity and not talk about fellowship. They're all one and the same. We need to understand what he says then in verse 4, and these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. That's interesting. My joy may be full. I'm taught to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And all sorts of things talk about joy. Well, since he's talking about being in fellowship with God, he's saying you need to know that your joy may be full, and I'm writing this letter to you, that you can have that kind of joy. What does it mean? I'm out here doing cartwheels in the yard or something like that. No, it, it, it's a sane thing. It's an intellectual thing. It's something you can evalu evaluate in your own mind. Well, what we're told elsewhere to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about being sure you're correct. 
I remember well, and I'm sure many of you do, don't know what to do nowadays and for the last several years, but I remember well on the, what were green boards then, everybody still called them blackboards. And of course they don't teach cursive anymore. But I remember in third grade and they started teaching us cursive. At the top of that blackboard was permanently uh, painted uh, lines. And then there was a little broken line through the middle of it. And as we were taught to write each letter, A, B, C, D, we saw where we were supposed to have the middle of that as we came up to the top where it was the curve or whatever it was doing so that we'd have it right and have a model, a pattern that we could follow. And all you have to do is think about maybe even some of your own you can remember, or maybe you kept some of it or your mother or daddy did. Uh, but you can remember with your own children, they bring home their homework and they show it to you and uh, they're learning. To, it doesn't have to be cursive. It can just be simply to write uh, as we normally do in print. And they're trying their best to follow exactly that pattern at the top of the page. And of course, it, it doesn't get any better if they don't try and if they don't work at it. And that's what we're talking about here. And that's why I have the New Testament mostly written to Christians. It teaches us how to work at it and how babe in Christ, a new creature in Christ, one just having been baptized to Christ for the midst of sins can grow and to develop. So John's saying, I want you to be full of joy. Well, how do you do that? Are you active? Are you concerned about doctrine? Are you concerned about what you believe? Are you concerned about the body of truth that guides your outlook on life, your viewpoint of yourself and everybody else? So verse five, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declaring to you that God is light and him is no darkness at all. Well, light has always stood for truth and darkness, the absence of it. I suggest sometimes you, you do some study on the idea of light, how it stands for truth and darkness how it stands for the lack of it it's always interesting to me that the people who are lost at the day of judgment the bible describes being in hell in several ways but one of them is outer darkness outer darkness now why would there be a modifier outer before darkness there's really a simple answer to that God's influence is not there at all. None whatsoever. So there's outer darkness. Now you think about people in this world who say, I'm going to do as I please. I'm going to live as I want to. Yeah, the whole world lies in wickedness because of the evil one. And he rules the world through lies. And he draws men away from God, which is his whole purpose for existing, by getting them to believe a lie and obey a lie, be separated from God and keep them away from the truth. You remember one thing, in order for the devil to get you, he's got to get you away from the word of God. He must. He has all sorts of wonderful ways to do that from his perspective and all sorts of sizes. But he gets you away from the light when he gets you away from the word of God. And there are people who love darkness rather than light. So when they die and they're sentenced to the place of torment forever because they didn't love God and keep his commandments on this, in this world, then they have what they work to have, complete absence of God. Outer darkness. So John says, we don't want that. You were baptized as Christ for the remission of sins. You don't want to fall back away. You want to stay in fellowship with us because our fellowship is with the Father. Then he says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Well, again, notice you can't know the truth of God and know you're living contrary to it and still say everything's all right with me and my God. 
I'm in fellowship with God. And I'm in fellowship with everybody that's in fellowship with God. But you're doing those things or not doing what you ought to do as the New Testament authorizes us to act. And that brings up again Colossians 3.17 is to the guiding light of all of us. Whatsoever we do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. If we're to stay in that fellowship, we must be concerned about teaching or doctrine, what we believe. And then once we know it, are we practicing it? Are we doing it? Is our faith without works? Are we disobedient? Because that means then we're lost. That's all it amounts to. We don't have that fellowship. I think one of the things that proves this more than anything else is Ananias and Sapphira there in the book of Acts, the first sin dealt with in the church involved money and involved a lie. Or think about that. Involved money and involved a lie, involved a lie, and involved a conspiracy between a husband and a wife to do what they did. And God killed them, period. Question. Is there a lesson in that for us? Does that tell us the God who is loved? Does that tell us that he's also a God of justice and he means what he says and he says what he means? So right there early on in the early church, not long after its establishment, two members, a husband and a wife, decided that they would come up with a fabrication, sell it, and there was no way in the world anybody could have known about it, at least at that time unless they had told them, except God who knows the hearts of men knew and in the age of miracles revealed it to the apostle Peter and he confronted them on it. And both of them dropped dead right in front of him. That's there to tell us God means business once we become a member of the church. If it's not, what message is there? It tells us that fellowship is important and you cannot claim fellowship with God or God's faithful people and live a life contrary to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And John says, we don't want that. So you go ahead down here and see that he says, you can't walk in darkness. That is contrary to the truth. You cannot live your lives. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, there's that walk again, live it. Then we lie. We actually lie. He's not pulling any punches. If you say you're faithful to God and you're not, you're a liar, period. People get upset about that kind of language and say you're harsh, mean, haughty, and proud and all that, whatever. Well, it still reads that way. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. We're not obedient. Uh, and by the way, it'll read just exactly that way on the day of judgment. It's not going to change. But then we come to verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Well, remember, he's writing this letter about fellowship, and he says, I want you, you brethren who've obeyed the gospel, who are members of the church, I want you to have the same fellowship with God that we have with God. And that's the reason I'm writing you this letter. So he expects them to be honest as they receive the letter. He expects them to apply it to their lives, uh, to be able to evaluate themselves. That's a daily thing with a Christian, to evaluate your lives. He expects them to be able to make changes if there needs to be any changes made. If they're engaged in things that are contrary to the truth, he expects them to change. If not, I don't know why he wrote the letter. Because it's written for them to learn, to understand, to know. And if they see in coming to that kind of knowledge that their life is not some aspect of it in harmony with the truth of God, then they can change. So he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth's not in us. We never reach a stage in this life where we're not subject to sinning. And we may commit sins of ignorance. We may commit sins of weakness. So what keeps us 
reconciled to God and in his fellowship. An attitude that realizes what I've just said, first of all. And next of all, to know when I'm doing my best, there's something that makes up the difference that works beyond my human frailties and my ignorance. And that's the precious blood of Christ that was applied to me when I was baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3, and 4, that I receive, whereby I receive remission of past sins. Permitted the Lord to add me to those who had done likewise, which would be his church, Acts 2, 41, 47. This is where the grace of God comes in. The favor of God. One of the things I I see I see the longer I live is the need for the grace of God. The need for his mercy. Because I've lived long enough studying the Bible, preaching the gospel, and associating with brethren and other folks to know that there's nobody perfect in the sense of they don't need to improve on something. And the grace of God was going to save us is extended to us through the truth of the New Testament. And how does it do it? Well, he's writing to Christians. Remember, he's not writing to those outside of Christ. He's writing to those who have been baptized into Christ. They're Christians. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, there's a sense in which that's so, and it applies to members of the church. Has to. It's written to them for their enlightenment. Cause them to think about themselves. Well, it's obvious if a person thinks, well, I've arrived. I've been a member of the church 50 years and I don't sin anymore. Well, I know what he says about that. He says anybody gets to that stage, the truth's not in him. He hasn't learned anything. He's gone backwards rather than forward in spiritual matters. But what is the attitude of the faithful child of God? He's aware of the fact that he needs God's mercy continually. He needs the favor of God that comes through the gospel that he's obeyed. Well, he says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I suggest to you that's not just confessing specific sins that we recognize we do. It's a general attitude that says, I know I can sin and I may have and I haven't recognized it. Help me to see it and please forgive me of it. I remember somebody trying to pin a preacher down one time. He says, well, here's this fellow that lived a long time outside of the church. And he had really had the bad habit of using terrible curse words. And he obeyed the gospel and uh, was a little while in the church doing all he could. And he was a roofer. He was up on top of the house, roofing a house. And he hit his thumb real hard with the hammer and let out a big curse word, slipped and fell and broke his neck and killed himself right there. Was that man saved? I think the preacher answered it pretty good way. He said, well, all I can say is he should have been on top of the house. Well, that doesn't answer us. What's going to, what's going to cover the sins of weakness? What's going to cover those sins we don't want to commit and we do our best not to? What's going to cover all of that? Well, if it's not mentioned in verse 7, it's not mentioned anywhere. Do we think we contact the blood of Christ? We're baptized. That's the end of it. We don't need any more. You know, if you go back to the types and shadows of the Old Testament and the teaching that it did, the Passover of the children of Israel, of the administrator of death to the firstborn in Egypt, and that was not only firstborn of humans, but all animals too. Israel was given the pass on that, literally. They took the blood of a lamb and they put it on the linen lint mantle doorpost, whatever you call it. And he said to them, you're all in that house. And when I come to smite firstborn, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, brethren, that says when I stand before the Lord in judgment, if I've been faithful, it's not because I've become perfect in the sense I don't sin anymore. 
it's going to be because he sees the blood and he passes over me as if I had never sinned. But we need to understand that because it's encouraging to us to keep on keeping on. We get discouraged. Steve talked about that a while ago. The world, whole world lies in wickedness. He, he set out on a lot of it today. And it's going to always lie in wickedness. Well, what's going to keep us going? What's going to make it where our joy can be full in this world where the whole thing lies in wickedness? And by the way, it can get a whole lot worse than what it is right now. What's going to do that? When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. If that won't give encouragement, come up with a better one. Jesus said, I came to seek that and seek and save that which is lost. He said, I'm the great physician. And so on, so many other things he used. But it depends upon our recognition in our lives, though we've been baptized for the remission of sins and our past sins, alien sins, forgiven because we're baptized in Christ for the remission of those sins. Depends on our realization that we still have sins of ignorance and weakness we may commit, and we're to be confessing those sins regularly and realizing that fact about ourselves. Now, that will help as much as anything to keep you growing and developing in Christ is to realize that the person who wants to do right, giving his life to doing right, can make a mistake from time to time. And yet the blood cleanses because he's continuing to confess his sins. When he knows a specific one, or just in general, the fact that I know I need to do better all the time. He says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Well, the word means teaching. His doctrine is not in us. The truth is not in us. And we don't really make him a liar because he doesn't lie. But what it means is we're going against what he teaches and it makes him look like a liar because he said that's not the case. He says the truth is not in us in verse 8. Now, all of this chapter then is talking about the importance of fellowship, the importance of being in Christ and how to stay in fellowship with God once we're in fellowship with God through obedience to the gospel that we've discussed. And we need to understand that when we talk about our fellowship one with another. You know, when you, you look at people you, you'll find brethren at times have held all sorts of ideas. Some of them, and maybe a lot of them, just simply were not taught by the Bible. But some people realize that they are learning, they're growing, and they're not going to let those things keep them from doing what they absolutely know is right. Other people are contentious or they want to promote themselves, or they have a pet hobby, whatever it might be, that they want to push. I think you'll find the Bible talks about dealing with them completely different from the person who's growing and developing and trying to do right, willing to be taught, willing to understand and grow and develop. We often talk about the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. American Standard says, the vain, that's pointless or empty or worthless, the vain glory of life. I think sometimes we give a whole lot more emphasis to the dangers of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. That vain glory of life works on people in strange ways. It makes us begin to think, well, I've been at this a lot longer than you have. What have you got to offer? I haven't already heard. And this kind of thing. Or you can't correct me. Uh, I mean, I was I was preaching the gospel when you're trying to figure out how to spell Bible. Won't work. That's why you have so many statements in the Bible about like being humble, condescending to men of low estate, and what pride does to us, puffed up. Even says, you know, we always talk about people need to know more of the Bible. The Bible even says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. But he turn right around and say, knowledge puffeth up. 
So it's uh, interesting to note there's a sense which knowledge, having knowledge, a lot of knowledge of right things can be very dangerous to us if it makes us feel like we're in the chief seat and everybody else is in our footstool. That won't work. Won't work at all. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be bold in the declaration of the truth. It doesn't mean we can't know that we know that we know the truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. I can know that. John says you can right here. And he's saying, when you read these words from this apostle, John, you know I'm writing these things to you. So when you read and understand them, you can have the same fellowship with the Father that we, the apostles, have with the Father. So he warns them about false doctrines of his day, people saying that Christ did not come in the flesh, that kind of thing. And we need to let this be then a guideline as to the matter of fellowship, of sharing with one another. The message brought from heaven by the Lord is for one reason only, for man's enlightenment. Tell me any other purpose of the Bible than for spiritual enlightenment. Man's need for spiritual enlightenment. What other purpose is it? God's light, God is light, and God's light of himself is in the word of light, you might say. That's his nature to be light. It's the very essence of his being. I found this rather interesting. It came from Vincent's Greek word studies. And uh, it's some of his comments concerning light. He says, light is immaterial, diffusive, pure, and glorious. It is the condition of life. Physically, it represents glory. Intellectually, truth, morally, holiness. As immaterial, it corresponds to God as spirit, as diffusive, to God as love, the condition of life, to God as life, as pure illuminating, to God as holiness and truth. Well, it's interesting if you look at that, think about it a minute, and then look back at the first chapter of John, <laughs> you see John followed right down with that. It's important we understand it. So I hope with these remarks, we have a very good introduction to our study of fellowship. And we need to emphasize, I think too, as we close out on this idea of light, that even today, light is the only thing that can purify something else without itself becoming contaminated. Think about that a minute. You can have the cleanest water there is in the world. Wash your hands in it. It's not clean anymore. So it's important that we learn these things. If we're to be one as God intends us to be one, if we're to have the fellowship with him that we uh, have when, we're right, when we've ra been raised from the watery grave of baptism, and if we want to keep it. So let's remember this. We'll start right where we've, and we'll close right where we started with saying that the New Testament mostly is written the members of the church to keep them saved. So we'll stop here. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer before we leave? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the day. We're thankful for our lives. Help us to realize how brief and uncertain life in the flesh is. Help us to so live our lives that we'll glorify thee in the church. We pray we'll recognize the importance of sounding the gospel out to the world that's lost in sin and the whole world lies in wickedness and needs the gospel. But above all, the church, that we will be what the Bible says we ought to be, that our joy may be full, that we will walk in the light as he is in the light, that we might have fellowship with one another. Help us to enjoy this fellowship, to appreciate it, to be strengthened by it, to cultivate it, May it always be on thy terms as revealed in thy word. Give us a good night of rest. Be with the sick, the old, the feeble, those who've lost loved ones, especially these of the household of faith. Help us all to increase in greater knowledge and practice of the truth. Please forgive us of our sins. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.